I'm going to recite two lines that my younger brother Shaheed Hafiz Muhammad Harun Rashid Ahmed Khan Rahimahullah Ta'ala would recite uh, when he would recite the praise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam مَا إِمَّ دَحْتُ مُحَمَّدًا بِمَقَالَتِي مَا إِمَّ دَحْتُ مُحَمَّدًا بِمَقَالَتِي بَلْ مَدَحْتُ مَقَالَتِي بِمُحَمَّدِي I do not say that I praise Muhammad with my poetry, but my praising him brings honor to my word. Hazar bar bashoyam dahanza mushko gulab hanuz name to guftan kamal be adabist. A thousand times if I wash out my mouth with musk and rose, and yet I would not be worthy to say your name even so. Unke nisar ko yi kaise hi ranjame ho, jab yad a gaye hain sab gham bulha diye. Our Imam Imam Ahmed Rida Khan, rahimahullah ta'ala, speaks about the remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, the meaning of this, when you have, when I have you, how can I be struck with grief? When I have you, O oh my beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can I be struck with grief? Whenever I remember you, I forget all of my griefs. <laughs> we have gathered here today to study Kitab al-Shifa. Alhamdulillah. We firstly thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this immense blessing. Say alhamdulillah. The great Imam Azam, Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu was asked, how did you attain such a great rank? How did you say, attain so much knowledge? And he said, whenever I learned one thing, I thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he allowed me to learn more. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to even be here in this gathering for the few moments that we have been here. And by virtue of them, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to study and spend more time in gatherings where we speak about, and listen to the praise of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Muslims, we recite the kalima tayyiba, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But for us to truly understand what we are saying when we say Muhammadur Rasulullah, Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we must understand who we are speaking about. Just saying Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam itself is more than enough for you to enter paradise. Our Imam, Imam Ahmad Rida Khan Rahimahullah Ta'ala in his book Tanhidul Iman, the preamble to faith. He says, if a person spent his entire life saying, La ilaha illallah, his entire life, because there are Buddhists who recite the word, La ilaha illallah, throughout the whole lives, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, there is none worthy of worship except Allah, they recite this. He says, if a person spent his entire life saying, La ilaha illallah, but did not say Muhammadur Rasulullah, he will not be able to enter paradise. And if a person said once Muhammadur Rasulullah, he will enter paradise. <laughs> Such is the power of just saying with your tongue and believing in your heart, Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then imagine the power that will be manifest in your heart, in your spirituality, when you actually know who is Muhammadur Rasulullah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our life revolves around Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This life is a test for us. When we leave this world, we will enter the grave. And in the grave, we will have to answer questions. Once we've answered the questions of the grave, then we will be considered successful. And we know from hadith, there are how many questions in the grave? Three questions in the grave. All of us, every single person, will be asked three questions in the grave. The first question will be, Marabbuka, who is your Lord? Those that believed in Allah, who worshipped Allah, replied, 
Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. But a question to all of you. Has this person succeeded by answering this question? Has this person succeeded? No, he's not succeeded yet. She has not succeeded yet. Even though this person has said in the grave, my Lord is Allah, they have not yet succeeded. So what we learn is that is not enough to succeed. Just to say, my Lord is Allah. That's why there's a second question, and the second question is, ma dinuka? What is your religion? What is your religion? And the believer will reply, Dini al-Islam, my religion is Islam. But the one who answers the second question correctly and says, my religion is Islam, has this person succeeded the test of the grave? Still not. This person has still not succeeded. This person has said, has the ability, because he spent his life, Believing Rabbi Allah, died with Rabbi Allah, died with the Deen of Islam. But despite that, this person has not succeeded. What will determine whether this person has succeeded in this entire life that you live, this short life of 60, 70, 80 years, 100 years, very short life, what will determine whether a person has succeeded in this short life is whether he or she will be able to answer the third question. The third question is the most important question. Because if this person fails to answer this correctly, this person has failed the test of life and has failed the test of the grave. This question is so important that the great Imam Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari radiallahu ta'ala anhu in his Sahih, Sahih Bukhari, he only mentions this third question. In his narration that he mentions, he only mentions the third question. Such is the importance of this. What is the third question? The third question, the veils will be removed between this deceased. Some say the veils between this person and all the way to Medina to Munawara, the veils will be removed. And then this person in the grave will see the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will see that beautiful countenance. But he and she would know what is this countenance because they've read about it. They will see those beautiful long tresses, the Zulf Mubarak. But they will know because they've read about the Zulf Mubarak, the blessed hair, the blessed tresses. They will see that beautiful smile and those beautiful white pearl-like teeth. More beautiful than pearls, the blessed white teeth. But this person will know, because I've read about this, and in fact some people would say, I have, I have already been graced with this vision. And then the third question will be, مَا كُنْتَ تَقُولُ فِي حَقِّ هَذَا الرَّجُلْ What did you used to say about this man? Yes, you believe in Allah. Yes, your religion is Islam. But if you want to succeed, tell me, مَا كُنْتَ تَقُولُ فِي حَقِّ هَذَا الرَّجُلْ what did you used to say about this man? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did you used to say about this man? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is the pivotal point. That is the integral question which will determine whether your 60 years in this world were useful or useless. That will deter, determine whether your life, the breaths that you breathed, and the beats of your heart and your days and nights, whether they were worthy of entering paradise or not, is what did you used to say about Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From this we understand, as believers, it is extremely important for us to stay connected to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you did not spend any time studying the Prophet Sallallahu If you spend no time building a connection with the Prophet Sallallahu how on earth will you be able to answer this question? That person who spent that time to recognize the Prophet Sallallahu inshaAllah will be able to answer this question. Now the question is, how can we build that recognition, that ma'rifah, 
of the Prophet To know the Prophet you must, number one, study the seerah, the biography of the Prophet Study the seerah of the Prophet This is the biography. Number two, you must study the shama'il, the description of the Prophet Number three, you must study the khasa'is, the special qualities of the Prophet Number four, you study the mu'jizat, the miracles of the Prophet Then number five, you spend your days and nights reciting salawat, sending durood and salam upon khaybul anam This is what the scholars mention when you read the books of Sirah, Shama'il, Ashifa, the commentaries of Ashifa. This is what the scholars have said. You want to recognize the Prophet وسلم, These are the five things that you do. You study the Sirah, the biography of the Prophet The Sirah is very vast. The Sirah is very vast. You study the Shama'il, the description of the Prophet The description of the Prophet وسلم, is very vast. I'm, I'm avoiding certain discussions because they start with Shifa, when you start the, the text. That's when we'll uh, be focusing on these discussions. You study the Khasa'is, مَا يُجَدُ فِيهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ يُجَدُ فِي غَيْرِهِ Those things that are special to the Prophet they are only found in the Prophet or they are only granted to the Ummah of the Prophet by virtue of the Prophet The Khasa'is. Number four, Mu'jizat, the miracles. Those that manifest from the Prophet ﷺ that break the norms of nature, that break the norms of habit. And number five is you recite salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine spending your life like this. Imagine spending your days and nights reading the seerah and then embodying the seerah. <coughs> reading the shama'il and then embodying the shama'il. Reading the khasa'is. You can't embody the khasa'is. Reading the mu'jizat. And then sending salawat upon the Prophet Just Imagine spending a life like that. Now the question is, how do we do this? And this is the special quality of Ash-Shifa. Because Ash-Shifa has incorporated all of these. Uh, somebody once asked Imam Ahmad uh, Rida Khan, anh, they said, some people say the Prophet Shafa'a will benefit on the Day of Judgment. Other people say, the, the Prophet ﷺ's shafa'a will not benefit his intercession. He said they're both correct. They're both right. Those that believe that it will benefit them, it will benefit them. Those that believe it will not benefit them, it will not benefit them. <laughs> so these five means of connecting to the Prophet ﷺ are all incorporated in Kitab al-Shifa. This is one of the beauties of Kitab al-Shifa. All five of them are incorporated in this. The seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, because you, when you speak about the Prophet ﷺ, you will inevitably speak about the biography. You have the shama'il, there's a whole section on the description of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. You have the khasa'is, a whole section on the khasa'is, the special qualities of the Prophet ﷺ. You have the mu'jizat, the entire section on the mu'jizat, the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. And then you have Every time you mention the name of the Prophet وسلم, you're going to be reciting salawat upon the beloved وسلم. And in addition to that, there's a whole chapter on the virtues of salawat and the rules and regulations of salawat upon the Prophet وسلم. This is one of the beauties of a shifa. It incorporates all of these methods and means of us growing close to the beloved Prophet وسلم. Imam Qadi Iyad, in his introduction, which we will cover, inshallah, either today, inshallah, we're going to start it today, we might even complete it. He mentions the, the motives of writing a shifa in the introduction. If you've had a glance at the introduction in your copies, you would see that he's mentioned the motives. <coughs> Before we even start, I'll mention two things. I mentioned right at the start. We attend gatherings like this. Why? So that we can increase in our love for the Prophet So we can increase in our love for the Prophet That's our motive. 
جان ہے عشق مصطفیٰ روز فضوم کرے خدا امام احمد رضا خان رضی اللہ عنہ سیز جان ہے عشق مصطفیٰ روز فضوم کرے خدا جس کو ہو درد کا مزہ ناز دوا اٹھائے کیوں لائف از دا لو آف دا پروفیٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم That is life. Life is the love of the Prophet Sallallahu The love of the Prophet Sallallahu is life. Roz fazum kare khuda. May Allah increase this love every single day. May my love for the Prophet Sallallahu today be more than it was yesterday. And may my love for the Prophet Sallallahu tomorrow be more than it is today. Jisko ho dard ka maza naze dawa uthaye kyun. The one who feels pleasure in this pain, this pain, there is a pain because we're separated from the beloved, but the one who feels pleasure in this pain, why would he ever take the burden of taking medication? Why would you look for medication for this pain? Because this is that pain that we find pleasure inside it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second point, Qadi Iyad mentions in the introduction of his text, he wants to in this text, explain the status of the Prophet ﷺ. That's what he's attempting to do. But to a degree, to understand the status of the Prophet ﷺ. Because we will never in reality understand the status of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. The status of the Prophet ﷺ, the rank, the station of the Prophet ﷺ is such and we will talk about this more. It is such that every single moment the rank of the Prophet is increasing. Every single moment the rank of the Prophet is increasing. The virtues of the Prophet every single moment are increasing. The worldly life of the Prophet 63 years. But before that and after that, Every single moment, the rank of the Prophet ﷺ is increasing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Noble Quran says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels are sending salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. The salawat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends upon the Prophet sallallahu is increasing in his status. And yusalluna is not a past tense verb. It's a present tense and a future tense verb. It's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prayers of peace and blessings, meaning sent salawat. It's not past tense. It is present tense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu as we speak, the rank of the Prophet ﷺ is increasing. You speak about one virtue of the Prophet ﷺ right now. Before you finish mentioning that virtue, he has already increased in his virtues. You take one breath. Before you've breathed out that breath, he has increased in another virtue. Before you take in the next breath, he has increased in another virtue. Before your heart beats the next beat, he has increased in his virtues. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. خدا کی عظمتیں کیا ہیں محمد مصطفیٰ جانے خدا کی عظمتیں کیا ہیں محمد مصطفیٰ جانے مقام مصطفیٰ کیا ہے محمد کا خدا جانے خدا کی عظمتیں کیا ہیں محمد مصطفیٰ جانے Every line that I would recite or translate into English The, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa will ever know. And the greatness of Muhammad Mustafa, only the Lord of Mustafa will know. Sallallahu alayhi wa So we will not understand the rank of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But maybe if we increase in our love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then maybe Allah jalla wa ala will give us some, something. Imam Shah Fuddin al-Busiri, rahimahullah ta'ala, says, كالشمس تظهر للعينين من بعد صغيرة وتكل الطرف من أمامي. He says the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is a very uh, loose translation. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is like uh, the sun 
that when you look at the sun from far, the sun seems small, صغيرة. The sun seems small. But when you actually look at the sun and you focus at the sun and your glance locks at the sun, then the sun will leave you dazzled. The Prophet ﷺ, when you say Muhammadur Rasulullah ﷺ and you, you haven't really thought about who is Muhammadur Rasulullah ﷺ, that those blessed four letters, Meem, Ha, Meem, Dad, will, will grace your tongue easily. But when you actually realize who is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will be left bewildered, bewildered and dazzled. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before we move on to the text, we must know some points about the author of this text. Before studying Kitab al-Shifa, we have to know some points regarding the author, Qadi Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala. So before we even cover the text, we will cover some points regarding Qadi Iyad Rahimahullah and some points regarding the actual book of Shifa and what scholars have said regarding the Shifa and the blessings that we will uh, receive from a Shifa, inshallah. First of all, Lawla Shifa ma dhukir Iyad. Lawla Shifa ma dhukir Iyad. If it was not for Kitab al-Shifa, Qadi Iyad would never have been mentioned. There's a, a statement that the scholars of Hadith uh, make. If it was not for Kitab al-Shifa, Qadi Iyad would not be known. So in reality, you will know who Qadi Iyad is when we start studying the Shifa. So we don't even have to do this. To study a Shifa, then you'll realize who Qadi Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, is. But for Barakah, we will mention some points regarding Qadi Iyad. In Arabic, we uh, pronounce his name Qadi Iyad, but Qad, the book of Shifa spreads throughout the world. In South Asia, because we pronounce the word as a za sound, then they refer to him as Qazi Iyaz. So you'll hear our South Asian ulama, they're quoting uh, a Shifa, left, right, and center in their texts and their speeches, but they will say Qazi Iyaz. His name, Iyad bin Musa bin Iyad. Iyad bin Musa bin Iyad <coughs> bin Amrun. Uh, it is said that his ancestry goes all the way back to Imam Malik bin Anas. Ta'ala. He's a descendant of the great Imam Malik, Imam Dar al Hijra, the great lover of the Prophet. And uh, this, the Maliki school is known for the love of the Prophet. Imams had immense love for the Prophet ﷺ. But Imam Malik is known. His fatawa, sometimes you read his fatawa and it's just filled with the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Malik lived in Madinat al Munawwara. Zadahullah sharafun ta'adima. Now, we're speaking about Qadi Iyad, but we might go into Imam Malik. SubhanAllah. We'll, we'll, we'll do a tribute to Imam Malik when we start the text, inshaAllah. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. One point I mentioned. The blessed city of Medina al Munawwara is called Medina al Munawwara. Prior to it being called Medina, it was called Yathrib. It was called Yathrib. The scholars mention this, the Fuqaha, the scholars, the jurists mention it's impermissible to refer to Medina al Munawwara as Yathrib. We, can't, we should not refer to Medina Sharif as Yathrib now because the Prophet blessed it and now it is no longer Yathrib. Yathrib was a city of diseases. But when Sayyidul Anbiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed his blessed foot on the soil of Medina, it became the city of cures. The scholars mention this. All, all scholars, all fuqaha, our four schools, the scholars mention do not refer to Medina as Yathrib. Imam Malik says, the one who refers to Medina as Yathrib, he needs to pay expiation. He needs to expiate this. He needs to give kafara. You know the way you, somebody breaks a fast, they need to expiate that fast. Somebody commits a violation. They are, they are penalized. Imam Malik says, the one who refers to Medina as Yathrib, he will be penalized. What, what does he have to do? He has to say Medina seven times. <laughs> say Medina seven times. This is now Medina to Rasul. It is Medina Qayyiba. It is Medina Munawwara. Ala sahibiha salatu wa taslim. So Imam Qadi Iyad's lineage uh, goes back all the way to uh, Imam Malik bin Anas. He was born in 476 Hijri, Qadi Iyad. 
30 years, was born in 476 Hijri, which corresponds to 1083 in the Gregorian calendar. 1083 in the Gregorian calendar. His ancestors, they traveled um, to Andalus, originally Andalus, modern-day Spain, and from there they traveled to North Africa. I'm not going to go into detail, they traveled to North Africa. He was born in the city of Sabta, which is uh, very high north, northwest of modern-day Morocco. It's right on the coast. In fact, if you stand on the coast, you can see uh, uh, Jabal Tariq, you can see Gibraltar in Spain. That's how high north it is of North uh, Africa, of Morocco, that if you're standing on the coast of, uh, it's called Ceuta, uh, C-E-U-T-A, uh, it's called C-E-U-T-A, that's how it's spelled um, by the Spaniards, but the Muslims refer to it as Sabta. That's why Qadi Iyad is known as Sabti. Qadi Iyad as Sabti, because he was born there. Thereafter, his family moved. His family moved to uh, Morocco, uh, modern-day Morocco. He was from a, a family of knowledge, and his uh, uh, his ancestors were people of knowledge, and his descendants were people of knowledge. He himself was the qadi. He was the judge, and then. Three generations after him, so including four generations, were judges. His son was the judge, his grandson was the judge, his great grandson was the judge. By the barakah of Qadi Ayyad, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was born in Nis Sha'ban. So they say Nis, Nis Sha'ban, in the, around about the middle of the month of Sha'ban, possibly the 15th of Sha'ban, he was born on 470. He passed away, I'll mention this now, he passed away in uh, 544 Hijri. 544 Hijri, he passed away. That corresponds to 1149 in the Gregorian calendar. So he was 68 or 67 years old, depending on the calendar. If you follow the Hijri calendar, he passed away in, in the year <clears throat> uh, at the age of 68. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to leave the uh, rest of the discussions. As Shifa is enough to know who Qadi Iyad is. He passed away and he's buried in um, Marrakesh. Passed away and he's buried in Marrakesh. Scholars say different things regarding how he passed away, but the most sound of the positions is that he became unwell. He became unwell with a natural illness, and because of that, he passed away and is buried in uh, Marrakesh. He is, in Marrakesh, you have seven major awliya. When you visit Marrakesh, you should visit, and the only reason to visit Marrakesh is to visit the seven awliya. There's no other reason. Uh, they're known as Sab'a Rijal, the seven men, so when you, the seven saints, yes. So when you go to Marrakesh, that's what you should do. You should visit the seven saints. And as soon as you've done that, then you should leave straight away. <laughs> Those who've been there know why I'm saying that. Imam Qadi Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he's been praised immensely by the scholars. <clears throat> this is a book, the book that I'm quoting from now, is written by the great Muhaddith Abdul Hay bin Abdul Kabir al Katani, rahimahullah ta'ala. This is uh, one of the greatest uh, scholars of his time, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hay bin Abdul, uh, Abdul, Hay bin Abdul Kabir al Kattani, Rahmatullah Ta'ala Alayh, he is known as Muslim al Dunya, <coughs> one of the greatest scholars of hadith in his era, in the whole world. In the whole world. He, he was, uh, I believe, exiled. He was from his North African Moroccan scholar. He was exiled from, North, uh, from Morocco and he uh, was uh, sanctioned or imprisoned in France. Because it was under the French uh, um, colonized, it was colonized by the French. He passed away. He's buried in uh, Nice. That's pronounced Nice. N I C E. How you want to pronounce it? His blessed Mazar, his blessed resting place, is there. So he is a master muhaddith himself. So these are comments that he has compiled of other muhaddithin, and he himself is writing. 
So the comments we're going to cover now regarding Qadi Riyad or Kitab al-Shifa are by major scholars of hadith in our history. There's not random people just saying what they're saying. These are masters of hadith, these are masters of Islamic history uh, that will speak about Qadi Riyad and his Kitab al-Shifa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. <coughs> Uh, Imam uh, Abu Zayd Abdul Rahman Al Thaalibi Al Jazairi, he has written his own book regarding the Prophet and he says, in my book, I have intended what Qadi Iyad intends. So he's compiled his own book. He's speaking about his purpose and his maqsad. My maqsad is the same as Qadi Iyad. What is Qadi Iyad's maqsad according to this uh, great Jazairi scholar, Algerian scholar? He says, the purpose of Qadi Iyad's text is shifa min ta'kidi muhabbati ahlil iman li sayyidihim sayyidi waladi adhanan. The purpose of Qadi Iyad is to emphasize the love that people of iman have for their Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why I'm writing my own book. So this is one of the purposes that this muhabbith saw in Kitab al-Shifa, to show the love Ahlul Iman have for the Prophet <coughs> It's mentioned regarding Qadi Iyad that in his time there was no person who had mastered Hadith, Tafsir, uh, the Arabic language, Lugha, Adab, literature, and shi'ar, poetry, the way Qadi Iyad had mastered these disciplines. When you study Kitab al-Shifa, you will see this. He's quoting verses of the Qur'an, hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and then scholars who are commenting on those verses of the Qur'an and the hadith. And then the, his, his knowledge of poetry. And for those of you who are students of Arabic, you should definitely have the Arabic copies with you. You should be reading through the Arabic alongside the English. And you will see how he is speaking about the Prophet وسلم, the depth of his knowledge of the Arabic language. <clears throat> the great Hafiz Abu Abbas Ahmad al-Maqarri al-Tilimsani rahimahullah ta'ala mentions about his father. So this is an Egyptian scholar of hadith who is speaking about his own father, a Egypt, another Egyptian muhaddith scholar of hadith who is known as um, one of the greatest judges <coughs> he says that my father told me he had a dream and in that dream he saw the Prophet ﷺ. and a gathering was taking place where the Prophet ﷺ is surrounded by Sahaba and Ulama so he is witnessing this in the dream the Prophet ﷺ is surrounded by Sahaba and the Ulama and then he says that I see that in that gathering, in front of us, is seated the great Imam Malik bin Anas. The great Imam Malik is seated in that gathering as well. And then he says, I see behind the Prophet ﷺ who is seated. It is the great Imam Qadi Iyad. <laughs> Imam Qadi Iyad is seated behind the Prophet ﷺ in my dream. He said, I from this I understood that Qadi Iyad, what he is doing, he is following the way of the Prophet ﷺ. People made objection on Qadi Iyad that he is uh, innovating or he is uh, going away from the way of the Prophet ﷺ. But the Shaykh said, I had a dream and I saw Qadi Iyad sitting behind the Prophet ﷺ. From that I understood the maqbuliyah, the acceptance of Qadi Iyad and his iqtida, his following the beloved Prophet ﷺ. Qadi Iyad in his Kitab al-Shifa, Qadi Iyad in his Kitab al-Shifa, what is he referencing? What is he using? So of course he's using the Noble Qur'an. He is using the books of Tafsir. He is using the books of Commentary. He is using the Qutub Sitta, the six uh, books of Hadith. But the, the uh, it is, Imam Abdul Hay, possibly, he is saying the six books of Hadith, we know them, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan uh, Tirmidhi, Sunan Nasa'i, and then the sixth book is Sunan Ibn Majah. But Imam Qadi Yaw does not reference anywhere, uh, does not refer to a hadith from Sunan Ibn Majah. 
So the sixth book is the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So if you want to know which books is Imam Malik referencing, these are the books of Hadith that he is referencing. Other books of Fiqh, of the classical scholars, books of history, referring to the Islamic battles and Islamic conquests, books of Islamic theology, books of uh, usul, usul of hadith and tafsir and lugha, adab, and books of tasawwuf. These are the books that Imam Malik will be referring to in his Kitab al-Shifa. I'm going to speak a bit more about his methodology within the chapters uh, slightly later, inshallah. There are many commentaries written, there are many commentaries written. This book, Kitab al-Shifa, was so accepted, scholars wrote commentaries of Kitab al-Shifa. In fact, scholars would themselves write out the entire Kitab al-Shifa. They would write out the entire Kitab al-Shifa so that they can have their own handwritten copies. Imam al-Khafaji, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the greatest commentaries of Kitab al-Shifa is Nasim al-Riyad. Nasim al-Riyad printed in four volumes. He writes, and I was reading this just last night, in his, in his introduction, he is saying that the, the scholars would recite Kitab al-Shifa for Shifa. They would take Kitab al-Shifa when they fall ill and they would recite it so that they can be cured from their illnesses. It was one of the specialties of Kitab al-Shifa. He says, he's writing this, he goes, I am, as I'm writing this, facing a tribulation, and I'm just waiting and looking forward to that tribulation going away. As he's writing it, I'm facing a tribulation as I'm writing this. And because I'm writing it, I know it's going to go away. I'm just waiting for it to go away. This is how scholars would take it Abu Shifa. Now we have the printing press publications. We have books printed just like that. But traditionally, they would have to copy it out. Scholars and scribes would take Kitab al-Shifa and copy it out for themselves. <coughs> just, in the, um, just in the library, the royal library, the royal treasury of Rabat, just in that one treasury alone, there are over 100 manuscripts of al-Shifa. What do we learn from that? We learn how accepted Kitab al-Shifa was. That means... Just in that one place, they were able to gather 100, the, the manuscript of 100 ulama and scribes. That's how accepted Kitab al-Shifa is. How many commentaries? There is a, uh, a scholar from Rabat, uh, I, I forgot his name, he is, I think is contemporary to Sheikh Abdul Hay bin Abdul Kabir. He says over 40 scholars of hadith have written their own commentaries on Kitab al-Shifa. Over 40 scholars of hadith have written their own commentaries on Kitab al-Shifa. That's how accepted it is in the Ummah of the Prophet Sheikh Abdul Hay bin Abdul Kabir has a section here. Scholars of the West that have written commentaries and then scholars of the East that have written commentaries. Such is acceptance. Such is the volume of the commentaries on Kitab al-Shifa that he was able to make a division of the West, East and West. Scholars of the West have written commentaries. Scholars of the East that have written their own commentaries on Kitab al-Shifa. And each scholar has written a commentary based on different aspects. So you have scholars that have written commentaries on Kitab al-Shifa where they are referencing every hadith. So for example, you have the great Imam Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, the Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, Manahil al-Safa, where he, all he does is he just takes hadith and he surveys books of hadith and he references them. And I was reading last night something that would shock you as much as it shocked me. In the introduction of this Imam Suyuti in his commentary, he says, I have not been checking the books, I have just been relying on my memory. <laughs> in the entire Kitab al-Shifa, he's referencing the hadith, see I don't have time. I'm just relying on my memory and he's, each hadith is saying this is from this book, this is from this book, this is from this book, this is from this chapter of this book. This is the level the scholars would prepare and serve Kitab al-Shifa. I'm not telling you this so that if you want to read the commentaries, marhaba, mashaAllah, excellent. You should do that. 
I remember before I had uh, started my studies, I walked past, every day I used to walk past this library, and in the bookshelf, Sharp al Shifa, I used to see that in, four, in two volumes. Every single day I used to see in that library, Sharp al Shifa. This is before I could read Arabic, before I had studied, but I knew a Shifa. And I'm thinking, Sharp al Shifa, that must be amazing. I said, one day I'm going to read this book. So if you want to read them, make that intention and you will read them one day. But the reason I'm mentioning this, the primary reason, is to show you how much the scholars served Kitab al-Shifa. How much the scholars served Kitab al-Shifa. How much acceptance was, uh, there was of Kitab al-Shifa in the Ummah of the Prophet wasallam. Even kings, even kings of kingdoms would prepare for a shifa. How? I'll give you a few examples. <coughs> there was one uh, king. Qadi Abu Abdullah ibn Sakkak al-Fasi mentions that there was one king who, when he received Kitab al-Shifa, he read Kitab al-Shifa, and then he spread Kitab al-Shifa within his kingdom. All the institutions of, he introduced Kitab al-Shifa in all the institutions. Every institution needs to have Kitab al-Shifa and needs to teach Kitab al-Shifa. He introduced this within his kingdom. It is said, <laughs> after he passed away, somebody saw him in a dream. And the person that saw him in a dream said to him, How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with you? And he said, Ghafaradi bisababi kitab al-Shifa. Because of what I done with Kitab al-Shifa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave all my sins. He spread Kitab al-Shifa within his kingdom. Every institution will teach Kitab al-Shifa. <clears throat> Another king, Sultan Abu Annan, they saw him in a dream and they asked him, Ma How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with you? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admitted me into paradise. Why? What's the cause of that? Because I used to spread the recitation of Kitab al-Shifa. He used to encourage gatherings of Kitab al-Shifa within his kingdom. Within the institutions, read Kitab al-Shifa. He would introduce gatherings of Kitab al-Shifa within his kingdom. It is mentioned, one of the descendants of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, I believe it's his son, but is definitely one of his descendants, one of the uh, uh, kings or the emperors of the Ayyubid dynasty, one of the kings, emperors of Ayyubid dynasty. He was battling a, uh, um, a people and he was struggling to conquer them. So he meets some of the Salihin, and this was the way of our traditional rulers and emperors and kings. They would visit the Salihin. So this, the son of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, he visited the Salihin. And it is said that, he, he said to them, I, I'm, I'm fighting them, but we've been fighting for a long time. I need to conquer them. And then the, the scholar said to him that you need Kitab al-Shifa. <laughs> you need Kitab al-Shifa and you need to start reciting it. Muwadaba ala Kitab al-Shifa. Start reciting Kitab al-Shifa regularly. So he started reciting Kitab al-Shifa regularly. And by the barakah of that, he, would grant, he was granted victory and he conquered that land. <clears throat> Scholars would build their own, um, we're speaking about kings. Kings would build their own institutions and would inc include Kitab al-Shifa within their institutions. I mentioned one last thing regarding how they would uh, uh, utilize this. There was a uh, a scholar, and he said he, he was facing a huge tribulation. He was facing a huge tribulation, and he was struggling with that. And then he remembered that when he was studying in Al Azhar, he was studying in Al Azhar in Egypt many years ago, many hundreds of years ago. He said, "I remembered when we were studying in Al Azhar." We were facing a huge problem within our 
within the, the Ummah where you're facing a big problem. Then the scholars of Al Azhar said to the students, All of you gather and read Kitab al Shifa with the intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get rid of our problem. And I remember then that we gathered and we read Kitab al Shifa and we were granted victory. So then I took Kitab al Shifa and I started reciting it from Maghrib to Isha. He said, I gathered a group of my friends from Maghrib to Isha who recited Kitab al Shifa. And he's saying, before we even completed Kitab al-Shifa, I could feel my this trial and tribulation. It was an illness. I could feel my illness being removed from me. Wow. So the, the teachers of Al-Azhar are instructing their students to read Kitab al-Shifa. The Salihin are instructing their students to read Kitab al-Shifa. The scholars are writing commentaries on Kitab al-Shifa. Scribes are writing out with their hands Kitab al-Shifa. You can understand the acceptance that Kitab al-Shifa has had in the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's so much more to say but I'm going to leave uh, that regarding Kitab al-Shifa. And just before we step into this blessed book, uh, the manhaj, the methodology of Qadi Iyad in his Kitab al-Shifa. The methodology of Qadi Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, liyahsubi al-sifti, in his Kitab al-Shifa. Qadi Iyad, what he does in the introduction, so actually <clears throat> before that, important point, Kitab al-Shifa is divided into four parts. So this Kitab al-Shifa is divided into four parts. Imam Qadi Iyad in his introduction will speak about them. So I'm not going to go into detail, but just to give you uh, understanding. The first part is divided into four chapters. The second part is divided into four chapters. The third part is divided into two chapters. And the fourth part is divided into two chapters. So in total, there are 12 chapters of Kitab al-Shifa. Each chapter has usul sections. Each chapter says 12 chapters. Each chapter has fusul sections, fusul. And there are a total of 157 fusul. 157 sections in Kitab al-Shifa. This will allow you to navigate through Kitab al-Shifa, if you understand this. <coughs> you do not necessarily have to read Kitab al-Shifa the way you would read a storybook from beginning to end. You can take a specific part from the four parts, or you can take a specific chapter from the 12 chapters, or you can take a specific section from the 157 sections and read that section. That's how Kitab al-Shifa is divided. The methodology of uh, Qadi Iyad is, Qadi Iyad, in the, in, in the start of each fasal section, will mention a verse of the Qur'an connected to that section. If there is a verse where he can derive a point, he will first mention a verse of the Qur'an. So you can check this later with the sections open and look at the sections. And you will see that he is initiating the section with a verse of the Qur'an. After the verse of the Qur'an, he will go to commentary of, the, of that. To show that the point he is establishing is proven from commentators. He is not just come 400 years after the Prophet ﷺ making up a commentary. He is proving that his commentary is taken from qualified commentators of the Qur'an. And after that, you will mention a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The first hadith you will mention, the first hadith you will mention, you will mention it with the chain. His own chain, all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ, or to the Sahaba. So the first hadith in each fasl that you will mention, you will mention its chain to the Prophet ﷺ, his own chain. Thereafter, the rest of the hadith you will mention in the chapter, you will not mention the chain to avoid, uh, to avoid it uh, getting longer. Because the purpose of Kitab al-Shifa is not to present to you the chain. Rather the purpose is, well he'll mention the purpose. That's why he will not mention after the first hadith in the same section, the chain of narration. After that you will mention the quotations of ulama the great Imams that prove his point. If he's speaking about the, an oath in the Qur'an, 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he'll mention after that hadith relating to that with the first one with chain thereafter the hadith without chain thereafter commentaries of ulama supporting his point it shows you the depth of knowledge of Qadi Iyad rahimahullah ta'ala alhamdulillah rabbil alameen inshallah we will start every dars with fatiha for the great imam Qadi Iyad rahimahullah ta'ala The way uh, we will study Itawu Shifa is I'm going to read the Arabic first and then we're going to be using the translation. So I will uh, translate it and then if need be, we'll give commentary. In the Muqaddima, the introduction, there won't be much commentary. Okay? Because we only have about 20 minutes for today that remain. There won't be much commentary in the introduction. Uh, thereafter, each fasl, there will be more commentary. So that's how we will do it. Recite Arabic first, then the translation, and then after that the commentary of what has been translated. So this is the Muqaddimah here. This is on. This actually, those of you who have the book, this actually starts on page seven uh, on the Roman numerals before before the book, because the contents page is actually part of the book. Because Qadir Iyad himself mentions the contents page. So come back to. Where it says author's author's preface, author's preface. That's the actual start of Kitab Shifa. <clears throat> this is a gathering of hadith, because Kitab Shifa is a book of hadith. When you enter the gathering of hadith, you should enter it like it's a day of Eid. You should enter it like it's a day of Eid. If this is not Eid, I don't know what is Eid. The day you speak about the Prophet of Allah, the day of Eid. So try to wear good clothes, try to put perfume on, and come in a good state. And before you come, do two things. Number one, listen to some nats on the sheets. Number two, recite the Dhu Sharif from the Prophet. It's important. I'm not just saying it. Because when you come to a gathering like this, you need to prepare yourself. You need to prepare the ruh. You need to prepare the ruh. So listen to the na'at or nasheed of the Prophet and recite the rood and salam of the Prophet so that you are ready. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallam. O oh Allah, bless Muhammad and his family and grant them peace. قال الفقيه القاضي الإمام الحافظ أبو الفضل عياد بن موسى ابن عياد اليحسبي رحمة الله عليه. Thus speaks the faqih and qadi, Imam al-Hafiz, Abu al-Fadl, Iyad bin Musa bin Iyad al-Yahsubi, may Allah have mercy on him. So of course this is not Kitab al-Shifa, this is the scribe who's saying, Qadi Iyad is now going to say. So you'll see this. In many of the chapters in the introduction, the scribe would have said, Qadi Iyad is saying. Again, this is a means of barakah. This is a means of barakah. You're saying, I'm not worthy of speaking about the Prophet ﷺ. Had I washed my mouth a thousand times with musk and rose, even then I would not be able to say your blessed name. So this is, there's a spiritual point here that Qadi Yad is saying it's not me because I'm not worthy. Qadi Yad is going to say. Alhamdulillah <laughs> al-munfarihi lismihi al-asma al-mukhtassi lil-izz al-ahma al-ladhi laysa dunahu muntaha wa la wara'ahu marma al-zahiri la takhayyulan wa la wahman al-bautini taqaddusan la udman wasi'a kulla shay'in rahmatan wa ilman وأسبغ على أوليائه نعما عما وبعث فيهم رسولا من أنفسهم أنفسهم عربا وعجما وأسكاهم محتدا ومنا وارجحهم عقلا وحلما ووفرهم علما وفهما وأقواهم يقينا وعزما وأشد وأشدهم بهم رأفة ورحما 
He's speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Just look at, as we're going to the translation, look at how he's speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at how he's speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Praise be to Allah who is unique in possessing his most splendid name and alone possesses invincible might. There is no final end falling short of him and no target to aim at beyond him. He is the outwardly manifest without need for the use of imagination and without illusion. And the inwardly hidden, absolutely pure, without that bringing about non-existence. He encompasses everything by his mercy and knowledge. He pours out universal blessings on his friends. He sent a messenger. Prior to this, it was the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he's going to speak about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sent a messenger from among themselves to both Arabs and non-Arabs, who was the most noble of them. The purest of them in nature and upbringing, the greatest of them in intelligence and forbearance, the most abundant in knowledge and understanding, the strongest in certainty and resolution, the one with the greatest compassion and mercy for them. In this introduction of Kitab al-Shifa, Qadi Iyad will speak about the Prophet ﷺ with many attributes. I'm not going to comment on them. The rest of Kitab al-Shifa is all an explanation of these titles. When you study Kitab al-Shifa, here he's mentioned the Prophet ﷺ is the most noble of the Arabs and the non-Arabs. That's why he's going to explain to you in his book. He's mentioning that the Prophet ﷺ is the purest of them in nature and upbringing. He's going to explain that to you in his Kitab al-Shifa. Therefore, I'm not going to comment on this. But just think about how he's speaking about the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Zakkahu ruhan wa jisman wa haashahu aiban wa wasfan wa aataahu hikmatan wa hukman wa fataha bihi a'yunan umyan wa kuluban gulfan wa aadhanan summan faamana bihi wa azzarahu ونصره من جعله الله له في مغنم السعادة قسما وكذب به وصدف عن آياته من كتب الله عليه الشقاء حتما ومن كان في هذه أعمى فهو في الآخرة أعمى صلى الله عليه وسلم صلاة تنمو وتنمى وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما الله purified him both in spirit and body and kept him free from all faults and blemishes, and bestowed wisdom and judgment on him. By means of him, Allah opened eyes that were blind, hearts that were covered, and ears that were deaf. And he made people believe in him. Those to whom Allah had allotted a portion of the booty of happiness honored and helped him. Those for whom Allah had written wretchedness rejected him and turned away from his signs. Whoever is blind in this world is blind in the next world. May Allah bless him with a blessing that grows and flourishes and his family and companions and grant them peace. Amma ba'd. Now he's going to the part, the introduction of a book classically is divided into two parts. The sermon and then the purpose. So the, the preface is divided into two parts. The sermon which is the praise of Allah and the Prophet ﷺ's salutations. Thereafter, it's the purpose. So up to this point was what we call the sermon, the khutbah. Before Amma Ba'd is the sermon, khutbah. After Amma Ba'd, this point onwards, he's going to speak about the purpose of Kitab al-Shifa. He's going to speak about how it came about, what's the purpose, and what is this book. Amma Ba'd. أشرق الله قلبي وقلبك بأنوار اليقين ولطف لي ولك بما لطف بأوليائه المتقين الذين شرفهم الله بنزل قدسه ووحشهم من القليقة بأنسه وخصهم من معرفته ومشاهدة عجائب ملكوته وآثار قدرته فيما ملأ قلوبهم حبرة حبرة ووله ووله عقولهم بعظمته حيرة فجعلوا همهم به واحدا ولم يروا في الدارين غيره مشاهدا 
فهم بمشاهدته فهم بمشاهدة جماله وجلاله يتنعمون وبين آثار قدرته وعجائب عظمته يترددون وبالانقطاع إليه والتوكل عليه يتعززون لهجين بصادق قوله قل الله ثم ذرهم في خوضهم يلعبون May Allah illuminate my heart and your heart with the lights of certainty. May he show you and me the kindness which he bestows, bestows on his friends, those who fear him, those whom he had honored with the hospitality of his absolute purity and whom he has alienated from other creatures through intimacy with him. He has singled them out for gnosis of him and for the vision of some of the marvels of his malakut, his angelic realm, and the traces of his power, and this fills their heart with delight and leads their intellect to into utter confusion, lust is in his immensity. They make him their sole concern and witness only him in this world and the next. They are blessed by beholding his beauty and majesty, and they go backwards and forwards between the traces of his power and the wonders of his immensity. They glory in their exclusive devotion to him and their reliance on him, they are dedicated to the application of his words. Say Allah and then leave them playing in their, in their plunging. Leave them playing in their plunging. فَإِنَّكَ كَرَّرْتَ عَلَيَّ السُّؤَالِ Now he's speaking to someone. Or the Iyad is now speaking to someone. The commentary say is either speaking to a specific person or he is created a person in the mind and he's speaking to him. And that person is the Ummah of the Prophet So he's speaking to us. فَإِنَّكَ كَرَّرْتَ عَلَيَّ السُّؤَالَ فِي مَجْمُوعٍ يَتَضَمَّنُ التَّعْرِيفَ بِقَدَرِ الْمُصْطَفَى عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ وَمَا يَجِبُ لَهُ مِنْ تَوْقِيرٍ وَإِكْرَامٍ وَمَا حُكْمُ مَنْ لَمْ يُوَفِّ وَاجِبَ عَظِيمِ ذَلِكَ الْقَدْرِ أَوْ أَصْرَ فِي حَقِّ مَنْصِبِهِ الْجَلِيلِ قُلَامَةَ ظُفْرٍ وَنَجْمَعَ لَكَ مَا لِأَسْلَافِنَا وَأَئِمَّتِنَا فِي ذَلِكَ مِنْ مَقَالٍ وَأُبَيِّنَهُ بِتَنْزِيلِ صُوَرٍ وَأَمْثَالٍ You have repeatedly asked me to write something. This paragraph now is extremely important to understand Kitab al-Shifa, okay? This paragraph. You have repeatedly asked me to write something which gathers together all that is necessary to acquaint the reader with the true stature of the Prophet ﷺ. With the esteem and respect which is due to him. And with the verdict regarding anyone who does not fulfill what his stature demands or who attempts to denigrate his supreme status even by as much as a nail pairing. I have been asked to compile what our forebearers, forefathers, I mean both our predecessors, and Imams have said on this subject, and I will amplify it with ayat from the Quran and other examples. This is what he's been asked to do, and this challenge is what he accepts. He later mentions a few paragraphs later, he mentions that he's accepted this. But before he accepts it, he mentions a few things. But before that, there's... So he's been asked what? He's been asked to explain, uh, to write a book, a compilation, which incorporates a ta'arif bi qadr al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To gather all that is necessary to acquaint the reader with the true status of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> Here's a grammatical point here. <clears throat> it says in Arabic, Bi qadr mustafa <clears throat> For the Arabic students, B here, some say that the, this B is tabi'idiyya, and the translation will therefore be, in the English, the translation will therefore be, to acquaint, to acquaint the reader with some of the true status of the Prophet sallallahu so if that point, that grammatical point was included in this, which Qadi Iyad mentions, Mullah Ali Qari mentions as well. Because the translation here is, to gather something that will allow the reader to be acquainted with the true status of the Prophet 
what the iyat is, how is that possible? How can anyone know the true status of the Prophet ﷺ? So you should be wary, you should be quite conscious of the letter Ba here in the Arabic, Biqadr al-Mustafa. The letter Ba shows you that it's not possible to be acquainted with the true status of the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, I will try and attempt to acquaint you with some of the status of the Prophet ﷺ. That's a point of grammar. Uh, Imam Khafaji said, this is a very latif, very subtle point that we should be careful of when we read Kitab al-Shifa because you will never be able to know the Prophet truly. Not even the closest of Allah's creation to the Prophet Amir al-Mu'mineen, Aftal al-Bashr, Ba'ad al-Anbiya, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq did not even know the Prophet truly. So how are we going to? Prophet himself said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, you do not know me, truly. فَإِنَّ الْكَلَامَ فِي ذَلِكَ فَعْلَمْ أَكْرَمَكَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكَ حَمَّلْتَنِي مِنْ ذَلِكَ أَمْرًا إِمْرًا وَأَرْحَقْتَنِي فِيمَا نَدَبْتَنِي إِلَيْهِ عُسْرًا وَأَرْقَيْتَنِي بِمَا كَلَّفْتَنِي مَرْقًا صَعْدًا مَلَأَ قَلْبِي رُعْبًا He's just been asked to, to compile a collection which will speak about the Prophet Look at his response. He says, No, may Allah ennoble you, that you have burdened me with a very difficult task. You have burdened me with a very difficult task. You have confronted me with a monumentous undertaking which fills my heart with trepidation, with fear. You're asking me to speak about the Prophet This is a monumentous task. Look at how he sees speaking about the Prophet Look at Qadi Iyad's mind. His immediate reaction is not, that's fine. His immediate reaction is, do you know what you're asking me to do? You're asking me to speak about the Prophet this is the inheritance of Imam Malik that Qadi Iyad received. This is the waratha, the inheritance Qadi Iyad received from his great grandfather, Imam Malik. Imam Malik was once walking in the street and someone was walking with him and the person asked him about the hadith of the Prophet. He's walking in the street and someone asked him about the hadith of the Prophet. Imam Malik looks at him and says, I thought you knew better. I thought you knew better. And he says, come with me. He takes him to his house, seats him, goes into the other room, performs ghusl, bathes his entire body, puts on fresh clothes, ties his imama sharifa, the turban, puts on perfume, and comes out, and takes his friend, walks to the masjid, then sits down, has his friend sit in front of him, and says, now ask about the Prophet This is the way of the Muslims. This is our, this is our, these are our ancestors. This is what we inherited from our ancestors. This adab towards the Prophet This is how you speak about the Prophet Even then they would say it's not enough. Even then they would say this is not enough. Imam Malik, Imam Qadi Iyad being asked to write this book to compile the, the virtues of the Prophet وسلم, and uh, the words he is using, you have burdened me with a very difficult task. You have confronted me with a momentous undertaking which fills my heart with trepidation, which fills my heart with awe. Oh, Arabic is ru'ab. My heart is filled with awe. Oh, ru'ab. It's a huge task that you asked me to do. The important lesson we learn from this. When we speak about the Prophet, وسلم, we must do ihtimam when we speak about the Prophet. If you're sitting cross, cross legged, you speak about the Prophet, وسلم, move your legs, put them straight to him. This other, don't say where this in Quran hadith. This is from other. This is from other. Ba other, ba nasib, be other, be nasib. The more other you have, the more fortune you will receive. The less adab you have, the more misfortune you receive. There's adab towards our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
فإن الكلام في ذلك يستدعي تقدير أصول وتحليل فصول والكشف عن غوابض ودقائق من علم الحقائق مما يجب للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ويضاف إليه أو يمتنع أو يجوز عليه ومعرفة النبي والرسول ورسالة والنبوة والمحبة والخلوة والخلة وخصائص هذه الدرجة العالية. Writing about this calls for evaluating evaluation of the primary sources, examination of secondary sources, and investigation of the depths and details of the science of which is necessary for the Prophet ﷺ, what should be attributed to him, what is forbidden or permissible in respect to him, and deep knowledge of messengership and prophethood, and of the love, intimate friendship, and the special qualities of this sublime rank. If I'm going to write about this, Qadi Iyad is saying, if I'm going to write about this, this means I need to evaluate all of these things. Primary sources, secondary sources. I need to go in, investigate into the depths and details of the sciences that will allow me to understand what is rationally necessary for the Prophet ﷺ? What can be attributed to the Prophet ﷺ? What is rationally possible for the Prophet ﷺ? What is rationally possible for him ﷺ? It will require me to have deep knowledge and recognition of the concept of messengership, of the concept of prophethood, of the concept of mahabba and khulla, of the concept of love and deep intimate love, and the concept of special qualities, all which is befitting to this rank. This is what I need to do what you're asking me to do. So you've asked me for this monumentous task. This is what I need to be able to fulfill this task. To conclude, because our, our time is up, to conclude here at this point. Just the introduction alone is teaching us how our behavior should be when we speak about the Prophet when we think about the Prophet it's mentioned many of the, the Salaf, the lives of Imam Malik radiallahu anhu it's mentioned regarding Imam Sakhabi in this very same point as well when the Prophet would be mentioned in front of them they would be struck with so much awe that their skin would turn pale out of awe, just of thinking about the Prophet So we haven't even started the, we're just doing the introduction, we haven't even gone, maybe we're halfway into the introduction. And we learn from the pen of Qadi Iyad, when you speak about the Prophet know who you're speaking about. Be aware of yourself when you speak about the Prophet Qadi Iyad is saying, this is what I need before I do this. This paragraph we've just concluded on, he's saying, this is what I need before I can speak about the Prophet ﷺ. Who is this? He's a master scholar. He's a master of hadith, master of language, master of poetry, master of literature. He's the qadi. He's the judge. He has the highest post. He has the highest post a scholar can have. And he's saying, it is very difficult what you've asked me to do. I need all of these disciplines and gather them together and only then can I possibly speak about this subject. So when we speak about the Prophet be careful of your state. Think about your state. Do the smallest thing that you can possibly do to show some other towards this conversation. For example, sometimes when I'm eating and somebody will mention the Prophet I won't have that discussion. How can you eat and have food in your mouth and then mention the Prophet I'll just tell them, look, eating. Either I'm going to stop now or then we can speak about the Prophet This is very, this subjective to you as a person. When you speak about the Prophet something that Muzambil does, which I really like, he mentioned the Prophet he placed his hand on his heart. You know, we've seen this where we've seen this, we all know. <laughs> but he practices it. He mentioned the Prophet so I seen place his hand on his heart. He's out of other. What do we do? Uh, the, the South Asians, what, uh, what did we learn from our ancestors? When the name Muhammad is mentioned, what do you do? 
our Honorable Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah Atif, Hafiz Allah Ta'ala, MashaAllah, I'm honored to have their grandchildren here in the gathering. It's a blessing to have you here. They do ihtimam of this. When the name of the Prophet is mentioned very slowly, they bring their they bring their thumbs to their lips without making a sound very slowly, place it on their eyes. And all they're doing is thinking about the Prophet. <coughs> so this is very subjective. You might have another way of showing your admiration and love to the mention of the Prophet. <coughs> Next week you have some very interesting points. Kitabu Shifa, just the title Kitabu Shifa. Uh, Imam Khafaji mentioned something absolutely amazing. The word Shifa is spelt in all the copies without a Hamza, whereas the word Shifa is always spelt with a Hamza. Shifa spelt with a Hamza at the end. The Shifa here doesn't have a Hamza. Is that a, it's not a printing error. <laughs> it's not a printing error with millions of books without Hamza. It's intentional. To that degree, we will study Kitab Shifa with the, with the permission of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala.